Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another edition of the IRENA Insights webinar series. My name is Karan Kochur, and I'm joining from IRENA's Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn, Germany. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I would like to introduce IRENA and our webinar series. IRENA is an intergovernmental organization with 169 member countries and another 15 countries in their accession process. We support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serve as the principal platform for international cooperation, a center of excellence, and a repository of policy, technology, resource, and financial knowledge on renewable energy. And because our analytical work and our engagement with our members generates a lot of valuable insights, we are constantly looking for more ways to share those insights with you. And that's why we launched this webinar series back in 2020. We have organized over 50 webinars on various topic, topics, and you can check them all on our IRENA events website. The link to that will be in the presentation. We understand that there are many longer deep dive webinars out there, but our aim is to keep these webinars short and sweet, lasting approximately 30 minutes. While we cannot cover everything in this time frame, we hope to give you enough information, and more than that, the sources of the in-depth information to help you explore this topic further. Today, in the next 30 minutes, we'll hear from Michael Taylor, who leads IRENA's work on renewable energy costs. He will share insights from one of IRENA's flagship reports titled Renewable Energy Costs in 2022. But before I hand over the microphone to him, a few housekeeping items. The webinar will be recorded and posted on our events website. You are by default on, on mute but we encourage you, I encourage you to use the Q&A or the chat function to ask any questions, which we will take up at the end of the webinar after the presentation. So without any further ado, let me welcome Michael to our Insights webinar series. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, for that introduction. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with you here today uh, and take you through, as Karen mentioned, some of the insights from our latest report, Renewable Power Generation Costs in 2022. Uh, as a bit of a bonus for those of you that have taken the time to join us, I've actually included some analysis and data that is not in the report. Um, so you'll be seeing um, most, you'll be seeing this for the first time, actually, that's been shown in the public. So we like to give back to those who who take the time to join us. So awful lot of material. So with that, I'm gonna jump right in. Uh, first of all, you know, obviously we're all aware of uh, the fact that 2022 was quite an exceptional year for the energy sector, um, unprecedented even. Uh, and, and we think it's a year of both crisis and change. And I'll talk about that later on. But it was also filled with a lot of what I would consider predictable surprises, uh, at least uh, for those of us who were looking at the sector in a lot of detail. And so this report is around four key themes that I think are important to extract from the data that we collected and analyzed uh, and uh, which are presented in the report. So I'm, I'm not gonna talk to these in detail here, but these are the kind of the four points around which I'm going to structure this presentation, and I hope which you'll find um, particularly useful uh, in terms of having a chance to understand a little bit more what's behind the, the analysis and the charts that we presented in the report. So first of all, the big picture. Global average costs generally fell uh, in 2022, so this is weighted by capacity that was installed. So this was fell for the cost of electricity, um, but it's not all good news. And you can you can imagine what that qualifier is um, in uh, probably quite clearly. So we saw declines in the global weighted average average cost of electricity uh, across the board, except for offshore and hydropower. Now hydropower was up slightly, and we'll talk a little. Sorry offshore wind was up slightly, hydropower was up quite significantly. I'll talk about offshore wind a bit later why that happened, but for hydropower, this was really a story about a, um, a number of very large projects that were com commissioned in 2022, which had very significant cost overruns. There is an upward trend with hydropower, uh, but uh, 
2022 was an exception and we expect to see a correction next year as long as we don't have again a number of over um, over budget projects. Importantly for PV and onshore wind, this was really a story about China's increased share in deployment. They have lower than average costs globally. And so when they increase their short share, that drags down costs, even if there's some cost inflation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Here you can see a chart for the levelized cost of electricity on the y-axis and the global weighted average, which is the line between the two dots for 2010 and 2022 by technology, left to right, PV, concentrating solar power, offshore, wind, onshore, and then the mature renewable technologies, biomass, geothermal, and hydropower. You can see very dramatic cost reductions uh, for the cost of electricity from solar PV, almost 90% over those 12 years. Uh, very significant again for off onshore and wind and CSP, almost 70% and almost 60% uh, for uh, um, offshore wind. So we're used to, in the last year or so to be talking about cost inflation. This represents very dramatic cost deflation over the period of 12 years. Uh, what that means is that solar and wind, I'll, I will go back. I should have mentioned that the 5th and 95th percentile ranges are here on the chart, and this is by project, in the shaded areas, and the grey band across the bottom is the fossil fuel cost range. So you can see that for PV, offshore, onshore, biomass and geothermal, all of the weighted averages were undercutting the levelized cost of electricity from new fossil fuel fired projects. So what this means is that today we have very competitive electricity from solar and wind where new electricity generation is required. And as I mentioned, uh, the global weighted average LCOE of onshore wind was actually 52% lower than the cheapest fossil fuel option in 2022. And for utility scale solar PV, uh, it was 29% lower. So this represents a really dramatic change in the competitiveness of renewables, uh, particularly solar and wind. And it meant, so on the right-hand side, you can see a chart which shows the gigawatts of capacity, new capacity added each year, which cost, which were cost less than fossil fuels, new fossil fuel options. So that's above the zero axis here. And those that were more expensive which is below the zero x-axis here, y-axis here. And so what you can see is that through time as costs fell, we've seen an increasing percentage of projects commissioned that are cheaper than the lowest fossil fuel fired cost option. And that was indeed 86% of all new utility scale capacity added in 2022. So competitiveness, uh, obviously the, the great question on many people's um, lips these days is what about our renewable power generation cost inflation in 2022 and 2023? So have we seen a leap forward in competitiveness or is there a slippery landing here? First of all, if we talk about competitiveness, comparing the LCOE of fossil fuels to, to renewables, there's some caveats. Obviously, this is a balancing um, um, uh, there's some caveats in terms of the to what extent you can use the levelized cost of electricity compared to overall system cost, which is the result of more, much more detailed modeling at the electricity system level. Uh, but if we're looking just at the changes using this broad metric of LCOE competitiveness, cost inflation for renewables is only one part of the equation. Obviously, the we saw a spike in fossil fuel fired power generation costs in 2022 in terms of the operating costs for the fuel, but also if you're considering a lifetime LCOE for new projects. Uh, and the situation is a little bit complicated beyond, say, equipment costs for renewable power generation technologies because of the general sustained inflationary pressures in the economy. It's just worth noting all of the data that we show for you from our database of over 21,000 renewable power generation projects is in real terms. So, and with the inflation last year, that is to say adjusted for inflation, 
So even if the real costs stayed flat between 2021 and 2022, that actually represents around a 7% nominal increase in costs. So bear that in mind when you see some of these numbers and think, oh, that increase maybe looks a bit low. You know, I assumed an increase. Uh, when it's in real terms, you have to take that inflationary factor into account. So having said that, um, what we did this year is a little bit different from other years where we had just a broad G20 fossil fuel fired cost range. This year we actually introduced our um, fossil fuel fired power plant cost database into the equation uh, to have a more granular characterization of the levelized cost of electricity from fossil fuels. And you can see here uh, on the left hand side the um, the trends in um, fossil fuel fired, uh, sorry, fossil fuel costs in US dollars per megawatt hour for natural gas and coal prices. You can see the general decline from around 2012 um, to 2020 before this spike in 2021 and 22. And that transfers through into the levelized cost of electricity for fossil fuels. So this is for new projects that would be commissioned uh, based on the um, the year of uh, fossil fuel prices in the year of commissioning. Obviously, an investor would be taking an outlook on the sensitivity around perhaps a 15 or 20 year fossil fuel price outlook. But for simplicity here, we're focusing in on what's happening um, just in the year of commissioning. And you can see that across 20 countries where we have detailed fossil fuel plant data, you can see uh, the, again, a similar trend, particularly for CCGT that follows the fossil fuel um, price and a little less sensitivity for coal fired generation with its higher capital costs, which tend to mute uh, to some extent that increase uh, in fuel costs for coal in 2022. Obviously, we hope 2022 is going to remain an aberration. So perhaps 2021 values on these charts for the levelized cost of fossil fuels is more re realistic assessment of expectations going forward for the cost of fossil fuels. So what we can do with our global weighted average or our country level weighted average of the levelized cost of renewable technologies, we can subtract from that the fossil fuel fired costs, uh, LCOE. And you can see that here for onshore wind competitiveness trends across uh, the countries for which we had the detailed data here. And you can see when it's above the y-axis, there's a renewables cost more than the cheapest, no, the average cost of newly commissioned fossil fuel fired projects in different countries. And once it's below the y-axis uh, of zero, you can see in green that it's significantly, in these cases, cheaper. Now, what happened for onshore wind was that 2021 and 2022, when we look at this simple metric for competitiveness, saw the largest in improvement in competitiveness in 2021 and 2022, with the exception of Japan, which is a little bit of a, an, um, a very small market these days for onshore wind. When we look at solar PV, the trend is quite different. You can see that in red, we spent much more of the last 12 years being with projects that were being driven down the cost curve. And so a, a larger red proportion on most of these charts. And you can see that that dramatic cost, which we'll also look at a bit in, in a minute, um, dramatic cost reduction for solar PV modules in the period 2009 to 2012 uh, was the period with the greatest improvement of competitiveness, but the increase in fossil fuel fire costs in 2021 and 2022 meant that some countries actually switched over and we saw an acceleration in the recent trend in competitiveness. So that's something a little bit new for this year's report that integrates uh, this, this new set, more detailed, granular, fossil fuel fired um, power generation cost data. So moving on to what actually happened with the renewable power generation technologies, you can see here across um, 20 of the major markets for which we collect detailed data, and you'll see that in a minute, 
the 2021 and 2022 LCOE in the bars on the top, and then the percentage change between 2021 and 2022 uh, with the bars colored in red and green. And you can see quite significant cost inflation in uh, a number of particularly European markets for solar PV, um, but cost inflation has definitely not been evenly felt. Uh, and partly this relates to the fact that obviously the total installed cost and the levelized cost of electricity for solar PV is dependent on more than just uh, the, uh, the equipment costs. So labor and build of materials are also under pressure as well. Different market scales and project development lead times are having an effect here. There's a lagging impact between commodity price increase, increases, equipment cost increases, and then total project costs. So that has to be taken into account as well. So there may be more cost inflation to come. I would just mention, don't discount the economic incentive to deploy rapidly in 2022 and 2023. Many project developers would have taken additional costs to get their projects online to take advantage of the very high wholesale electricity prices that we experienced last year and indeed above average ones that we're experiencing this year. Um, so though those projects will be making very, very good returns despite this cost increase. When we look at the underlying drivers of the, the cost increase for utility scale solar PV, the main story in at least 2021, but not 2022, was the increase in module costs with supply chain constraints, particularly around polysilicon. Um, but that has been alleviated to a large extent, given by the ramping up of Chinese production. And you can see here that um, over the space of um, just one year, the data from BNF suggests that polysilicon production capacity almost doubled, easing the constraints. As I mentioned, it's not all about equipment costs. Uh, so you can see here our detailed breakdown for solar PV, total install cost by uh, cost category. Uh, and commodity prices remain above pre-tandemic levels. And there's also general cost inflationary pressure across the board on many of these cost components. Uh, and because of the shorter development times or and construction times, any cost inflation in the general components of a PV plant or the economy passes through quicker into solar PV uh, than, say, for onshore wind and particularly for offshore wind. But there's, there's a reason to be a little bit optimistic, I think, about cost inflation, at least on the component side, total installed cost side, for PV. So looking at the detailed cost, cost um Components that have a major impact on the increase last year, we can see that a lot of a lot of the increase was actually coming through in in items which will, um, with the fall in commodity prices from their peak, um, reduce. So around uh, some of the racking and mounting, cable and wiring, uh, and the labour components, so mechanical and installation um, and margins. So there's a, there's some reason to be optimistic that some of these will correct after the imperative, particularly in Europe, on the left-hand side, as I said, to capture those wholesale prices, I think some of the projects will return to more normal times timelines, and that should have a significant impact on uh, reducing some of these margins and some of these cost components. So, so there's some reason to be optimistic, particularly in Europe, that the cost inflation may be um, is still there, but is not as severe as what we saw in 2022. But onshore wind, just very quickly, very different kind of dynamic compared to solar PV. Efficiency improvements in modules reduce the module price, reduces the area, so that reduces area-related costs like um, installation, racking and mounting, cabling, etc. So technology improvements for PV are largely, or not exclusively, acting through the total install cost. Wind is a bit different. We have an uh, falls in total install costs on the left-hand side, increases in global weighted average capacity factors, and that combines to an accelerated levelized cost of electricity production, uh, cost of electricity on the, the right-hand side. Uh, there is a little bit of increased volatility uh, in global weighted average capacity factors um, driven by China's share. 
switching by t plus or minus 10 percent in the last couple of years uh, and so you know that has played through a little bit into the LCOE calculations as well. Similar chart to PV here looking at the um, 20 markets where we have uh, good time series data and looking at the increase in the LCOE between or the decrease uh, between 2021 and 2022. Again, a bit of um, cost inflation was not evenly felt. Uh, partly this is because um, in some cases we have smaller markets with more volatile pricing, very much dependent on individual project um, cost characteristics. But there's also an impact of longer project lead times in many markets, particularly those with larger projects. Um, so those are typically outside of Europe. So again, quicker pass through potentially in, in Europe that we've seen. Uh, and again, particularly in Europe um, and indeed elsewhere, don't discount the economic incentive to bring forward the commissioning of some of these projects um, or to push on despite cost inflation, given the revenues that could be earned um, by even a few months extra on the wholesale market. For uh, wind turbines, uh, for wind power, onshore wind power, the significant driver of the cost inflation was coming from the wind turbine prices, which typically dominate um, the uh, total install cost. And you can see uh, it's a bit hard to pick up in this chart, but there's a, a quite significant increase of around um, from around, uh, you know, a low of around 800, 750 even for Western manufacturers um, and seeing the range increasing up to around 840 US dollars a kilowatt to 1175 in 2022, which is materially higher than in 2020. China is a, a market apart and there's reasons for that, but I don't think we have time to go into that in too much detail. The outlook remains elevated for 2023 uh, and given the significant uncertainty about manufacturers' profitability, that doesn't look like it's going to be easing any time um, soon. But, you know, materials costs for wind have come off their peak. Uh, they're still elevated compared to prior to 2020. Uh, and the need to rebuild margins and manufacturers, as I mentioned, is also important. But there's some potential in 2024 if these kind of uh, deflationary pressures and commodities come through that we can see some easing in the, the turbine pricing and therefore cost of electricity from onshore wind. Offshore wind, just very quickly, similar dynamic uh, to onshore wind, but less pronounced with the capacity factor. Again, the high share of, of uh, China in some years and deployment and the lumpy investments across countries, given it's a smaller market with larger projects, means we get some volatility that's not visible elsewhere. But cost inflation is very real uh, for projects, particularly looking at fi financial investment decisions at this point. And uh, where policy settings remain inflexible, that's going to have an impact. And you can see here the implied vestus increase in the Vestas offshore wind turbine pricing over the last uh, uh, period between 21 and 23, an increase of uh, around 44%, which turns out to be over 500 US dollars per kilowatt. Uh, so very significant other cost pressures across the supply chain around installation uh, and so on. So very challenging times for the offshore wind industry. And that's, you know, and this is, essentially heralding tight supply chains uh, from 2026, 27 onwards, and the, 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 the expectation that's going to have an impact on project total install costs and profitability. So very quickly, um, renewable power, was it the unsung hero of 2022? I think so. Uh, so in the report, we calculated the contribution of renewable power added since 2000, and it reduced globally the fossil fuel bill for the electricity sector by over 520 billion US dollars in one year. Um, so that's not the net savings, obviously, but that's the reduction for countries that are importing fossil fuels that um, would have seen 
that's a very large sum for countries that if we hadn't have gone down this path with renewables, it remains an open question just exactly how damaging last year could have been to the global economy. So with crisis comes change. Uh, the business case for uh, renewable power has been reinforced despite the increased uh, cost inflation in some markets. Particularly business and individuals have been having graphic indication of the benefits of renewable energy. And we've seen, for instance, here BNEF increasing their short-term um, growth and new deployment quite dramatically. So, and here you can see BNEF is now thinking that almost 400 gigawatts of PV alone might be added in 2022, which is quite staggering compared to where we were just a decade ago. And coming up to COP, obviously, we know that we need to accelerate. We know that there's a solid business case. The COP28 presidency is working on a pledge outside of the official negotiating track to triple renewable power generation capacity by 2030 and double the rate of improvement in energy efficiency. This is what our World Energy Transitions Outlook tells us is necessary to keep the Paris Agreements alive. And we've released a report with the COP28 presidency and uh, the Global Renewables Alliance just last week supporting that push, which you think is absolutely crucial to keeping the Paris Agreements in play. So with that, I would like to thank you for attention, and I hope you found that um, informative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael, for the presentation. To our audience, we encourage you to take advantage of the Q&A feature to ask any questions or even doubts that you might have. While you, while um, the audience does that, Michael, I would like to start the Q and A with the questions that we already have received. Yeah. Um, so I, I think uh, maybe I think I, I see that you're already typing an answer to that question. Well, perhaps I can just yeah. respond very quickly because they're both related to CSP. Yeah. So obviously, CSP as a dispatchable uh, solar technology, uh, where if effectively the cost of storage is very low compared to to battery storage uh, is that we think is a technology with a lot of potential to help us integrate very high shares of solar PV and uh, wind power it's not getting the policy support it perhaps deserves uh, and so yes deployment is 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 woeful and there's not a particularly good pipeline uh, at the moment and so that is a uh, what we would consider an increasing risk to the energy transition and may raise the cost of, of integrating um, this very low cost PV and onshore wind that we have in a number of regions. Um, so, you know, we have it in our world energy transitions outlook, we have a very significant role for CSP that is under threat. Uh, there is some traction now, again, in China um, and Africa, uh, but yes, much work remains to be done. Thanks, Michael, and hope uh, this answers the question. Um, I, I received a couple of questions on, on my chat also. Um, so maybe before that, okay, we already have one question uh, for solar thermal. Uh, would you like to take that? Yeah, so I mean, I think I've essentially answered that. The yeah. outlook is not great. Um, there is a pipeline in China, um, yeah. projects coming in Africa again, for instance, but, you know, it's... It's not where it needs to be. Sounds good. Um, and we address, you know, in the in the report with the COP28 presidency, we address five key pillars around the enabling frameworks and obviously that applies particularly to CSP, which is lagging. Sounds good. Maybe uh, we can uh, uh, take this question that I received on my chat. So you highlighted a lot of supply chain pressures for offshore wind. Do you see, uh, do you have any recommendations that policymakers and the industry can maybe look towards to reduce those those pressures in the future? Yes, so the, there's a there's a range of, I mean, the, this, this period of inflationary pressure came at a particularly bad time for the offshore wind industry outside of Europe. Uh, so, you know, Europe has had a, a, you know, a solid decade now or more even building up the regional supply chain it's mm. relatively robust. There's a lot of experience. 
it's hurting as as well with the commodity cost increases, labor costs, but particularly uh, the cost of capital. So the cost of finance, which I didn't go into in this report, this presentation, just because we didn't have time, but that's going to be a major factor as well for offshore wind. And um, so in Europe, where this is slightly more of a, a project pipeline and robust um, regional supply chains, that's not as disastrous this period that we've seen. We need more flexibility in the policy side of things. So we've spent a decade essentially driving the learning investments in renew and onshore in well in wind power and PV, and that's been very much focused on driving down costs. Now we need to look at the value proposition, right, of these technologies and the energy transition, and the fact that everything costs more today. We shouldn't expect renewables to necessarily cost less. Still. Uh, there's there's limits to that, um, but if you look at the overall value contribution to the energy transition, then we need to adjust our policies. Otherwise, the investment will go elsewhere. So as we're seeing projects being cancelled, particularly in the US, uh, and and investors are looking to to different markets where there's more flexibility uh, being shown. Um, so, but it 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 requires a little bit a holistic approach to the rollout, developing certainty around project pipelines over you know, 5, 10, 15 years, which allows industry to invest in the supply chains early, gives them the certainty. Um, and so what's happening in the US at the moment with the cancellation because of the lack of flexibility um, or allowance being taken for uh, you know, the, the unique circumstances we find ourselves in the last couple of years is particularly potentially quite damaging um, because it's going to also impact the supply chain, which also then makes it, um, you know, delays the energy transition, which we're running out of time uh, to keep the Paris Agreement goals in play. Thanks, Michael. Um, that, that, thank you for the response. Um, unfortunately, our time is up for, the, the, for today, even though there are more questions uh, I would like to thank Michael for his time and uh, for sharing his knowledge and insights on uh, on his latest work on renewable energy costs. I would also like to thank all of you for joining today and for your attention and your questions. We hope that you learned something new. In addition to the uh, to this webinar, Michael has also done a podcast uh, which is available on different plat uh, different uh, streaming devices. It goes by the name of What Matters. Uh, so you can also check that podcast out for more in-depth information on this report. The recordings and the slides to this presentation will be posted on the IDN events website for those who missed any part of the webinar. And I wish you a, rest, a good rest of the day and we hope to see you soon for the next upcoming webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you.